Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to six. Hello. Hello. Can I speak to Eleanor, please? This is Eleanor speaking. Hi. My name is Jan. I'm calling about the car that was advertised on the notice board in the student union building. Is it still for sale? Yes, it is. Your ad says it's a 1985 Celica, in good condition. It's old, but it has been well looked after. My family has had the car for ten years. I'm just the third owner, and my mother had it before me, so we know its history. We've got all the receipts and records. It's had regular maintenance, and the brakes were done last year. It runs really well, but looks its age. Why are you selling it, by the way? Well, I'm going overseas next month to study. I'll be away for at least two years, so I have to sell it. Unfortunately, it's been a good car. You want fifteen hundred dollars? Is that right? I was asking two thousand dollars, but since I need to sell it quickly, I've reduced the price. Would you like to come and take it for a drive? I don't live far from the university. Yes, I'd like to have a look. What time would suit you? Any time this evening is fine. Um. Well, I finish classes at six o'clock. How about straight after that? Say six thirty. Great. I'll give you directions. When you leave the main gate of the university, turn left on South Road and keep going until you get to the Grand Cinema. Take the first right. That's Princess Street. I'm at number eighty-eight on the right. So it's eighty Princess Street. No, it's eighty-eight Princess Street, and the suburb is Parkwood. You'll see the car parked in front. It's the red one with the for sale sign on it. Okay, thanks, Eleanor. I'll see you later. Bye. Later that day at the university, Jan meets up with her friend Sam and tells him about the car. Hi, Sam. Hey, Jan. What's happening? I'm glad I ran into you. I've decided I have to get a car. You're going to buy a car? Do you really need one? I'd probably still be driving, except that my car broke down last year. Instead of getting another one, I just moved closer to the university and went back to riding a bike. Better for the environment, better for my health, and I save a lot of money. Did it really cost that much? Well, when you think of registration, insurance, rising petrol costs, parking plus maintenance and repairs, it adds up.、Mm, I know it's going to be expensive, but I really need my own transportation. It takes half an hour by bus each way to university, as it is. But now I'm working at night in the city. There's no way I want to hang around waiting for a bus late at night, then walk three blocks home alone. Hey, I think you've got a point there. So, what kind of car are you looking at? It's an '85 Celica, same kind as I used to have. The owner's asking fifteen hundred dollars. That's pretty old. How many kilometres has it done? You know, I forgot to ask. I'll have to check tonight when I go to see it. Would you be able to come with me to have a look at about six thirty? Sure, I'll come. But I don't know a lot about cars. I do know one thing, though. I wouldn't buy an old car without having a mechanic look at it first. That's a good idea, but won't it cost a lot? Not really. You can get a check done through the Automobile Association for eighty dollars, and it comes with a report on the condition of the car. It can save you a lot of money in the long run. I'll keep that in mind. So we have to get to Parkwood at six thirty. Do you want to take the bus? It goes straight down South Road every fifteen minutes. Or maybe we could walk. I don't think it's that far. Actually, I could borrow my roommate's motorbike for an hour or so. He's working all evening in the library. Do you think he'd mind? No way. He owes me a favour or two. Okay, great. See you at six outside the student centre. Now listen to the tape and answer questions eleven to fourteen.
Welcome to the Dining Commons. This is the newest facility on campus, and I am proud to say, also one of the best. I know that all university students miss eating home-cooked food. Well, this year, we are hoping to provide students with food and services that will make you feel at home, even without your family. The administration has been listening to the voice of the students. Students gave us frequent suggestions last year as to how we could improve the university. One of the most frequent suggestions was improving the dining options. We have been working hard all summer to come up with ideas that will make student life in the dormitories more pleasant. One of the new options we are offering in the dining facilities is variety in student meals. Last year. There was a set menu for every dinner, so if students didn't like the food, there was no choice. Students had to eat whatever was served. But this new dining facility has three completely unique areas, each with a different theme. At every meal, there will be three options for students to choose from. For example, there might be Italian food at station number one. Which might consist of pizza and pasta. At station number two, there would be American food, consisting of hamburgers and hot dogs. At station number three, there could be vegetarian soups and salads, accommodating all the vegetarians. We hope that with the greater selection of food, all students will find something to their liking. Now listen to the tape and answer questions fifteen to twenty. Not only will students have more options, the food will also be better. Each section of the facility will have a head chef. These are real chefs that have been trained in culinary school, and have been hired specifically by the school to work in the dining facilities. All of the chefs have a speciality. The school is hoping that these chefs will prepare better-tasting and more nutritious food. Every student will be able to make suggestions, and also give their input as to which menus taste better. Last year, many students complained that the dining facilities didn't have very convenient hours. This year, we hope to change that. We will open for breakfast at 6 a.m. to accommodate all the early risers. In the evenings, we will open until midnight for all the students that like to go for a late-night snack. The afternoons will still remain closed, but we will have a student store open that will provide all students with drinks and fruit. The student store will be open every day. From 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Every student that has paid full tuition and dormitory fees has already paid for their dining facility fees. Students can eat at any time and in any amount for free. If you are a student that does not live in a dormitory, you can still purchase a dining facility card. This card will entitle you to the full services of the dining facility. This card is available only for students and is not open to the general public. If you are not a student and wish to dine here, you must purchase meals at the door. There are a few rules to follow. Even though we do not limit the amount of food that can be taken, we do not want students to waste food. Please do not take more than you can eat. Also. Every student must clean his or her own trays and plates. We will provide plates and trays for student use, but please do not abuse these items. Please do not leave your plates on the tables. Your parents are not here to clean up after you any more, so I hope all students will be responsible. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the upcoming year.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Laverton Arts Centre, how can I help you? Hello. I've been to the Arts Centre a few times recently and I understand you have this scheme for regular visitors. The Friends of Laverton Arts Centre? Yes, that's right. I wonder if you could tell me a little about it. I mean, how much it costs and what benefits it offers, things like that. Certainly. Well, first of all, the good news is that we've recently changed the scheme. It used to cost £15 a year, but now it's free. All you have to do is fill in an application form. You can either come to the Arts Centre and do that here, or you can go to our website and apply online. And so what are the benefits of joining? There are actually quite a few. As a friend of Laverton Arts Centre, you'll receive a newsletter every three months with information on all the forthcoming events. That sounds useful. You also get priority booking for shows and concerts in the main theatre. Can you explain how that works exactly? Yes. What that means is that when tickets go on sale, for the first two days they're only available to Friends of the Arts Centre. So as long as you book early, you can make sure you get seats. Great! Do you ever offer discounts to Friends of the Centre? Under the old system, when you had to pay to be a member, we did. Under the new system, there won't be any discounts for shows in the main theatre or films at the art cinema. Having said that, we will be offering some discounts to members for performances in the small theatre. There'll be information about this in each issue of the newsletter. I suppose I can find that information online as well, can I? Absolutely. Actually, we're redoing our website at the moment. Right now, there actually isn't a special section for Friends of the Arts Centre on the website. Once the site's been redesigned, there will be. You'll be able to put in your username and password and enter a special section just for you. It sounds excellent. Are there any requirements, though? I mean, as a member, do I have to do anything? Yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. There are no formal requirements at all, though obviously we have this scheme to encourage people to attend events here regularly. So we ask that you attend at least four events a year, whatever they are, if you possibly can. Nobody's going to count, though, and it's totally up to you. That sounds fair enough. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. While you're here, we're actually conducting a short survey of people who phone up the Arts Centre. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? It'll only take a couple of minutes. Sure, no problem. Thanks a lot. So, how many times have you visited Laverton Arts Centre in the last six months? Well, I've only lived in the area for the last four months, so not that many times. Um, three, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Fine. And how did you first find out about the Arts Centre? Let me think. Oh, yes, a friend invited me to a concert and I came with her. Have you ever seen a film at the Arts Cinema here? No, I haven't, to be honest. In fact, until you mentioned it earlier, I didn't realise you even had a cinema. One more question. If we offered a free tour of the art centre, including things such as going backstage to look at the dressing rooms, would you be interested in going on it? Oh yes, definitely. I think a tour like that would be very interesting. I'd even pay for it. That's great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. As you can see, there are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. And in case you've forgotten, my name is Dr North from the Marine Habitat Research Unit at the University and I'm going to continue from the lecture that I gave a fortnight ago on humankind's relationship with the sea from a historical point of view and also on attitudes to different types of fishing. In today's talk, 
I would like to focus on the current problems in the fishing industry in Europe and, in particular, the present scarcity of marine fish. As with the last lecture, I've placed a book list, a few relevant articles and a copy of this lecture on the department website. A statistic to begin with. Since the 1970s, stocks of the most heavily fished species have fallen, on average, by 90%. And why has this happened? Well, there's a chain of events which begins with the demographic changes that have taken place in the world over the last century. During this time, the world population has grown at a phenomenal rate, with efficient and heavy fishing, which is technology-driven, meeting the increasing demands for food. As a consequence, many fishing stocks in the European waters from the Atlantic to the North Sea and the Mediterranean, are now on the verge of collapse. But the problem is not restricted to European waters. It's a situation that's all too clear all around the world. Fish stocks in the Pacific Ocean, for example, are now on the verge of collapse due to a combination of overfishing and natural changes in ocean ecology. And there's another reason behind the increased demand for fish – and that is the changes in the eating patterns of different countries. Certain countries have a long tradition of fishing, for example, the southern European countries, but eating patterns have changed in countries like the United Kingdom, where fish was once considered as food for the poor rather than the rich. People have been turning to fish as a cheap and healthy alternative to meat, driving up demand and depleting stocks. Food scares like BSE and foot and mouth disease have also driven people away from eating meat, which again is invariably replaced by fish. As you listen, complete the table. Write no more than three words for each answer. Another important reason is that a sizeable proportion of the catch from modern trawlers or fishing boats is thrown away. Nets quite often land fish that are not wanted and which are thrown back into the sea dead. Discarded nets and other traps are responsible for the deaths of many fish. Our seas, like the rest of our environment, are littered with rubbish which also destroys lots of fish. And fish are also being changed by the chemicals dumped into the oceans, as well as by overfishing, so the size of certain species is decreasing. More then have to be fished to produce a decent catch. And the solution? Well, there has to be more than one answer to the problem. Fish farms provide a partial solution, but the quality of the fish is usually inferior to those in the wild. Reducing the amount of fish that any one trawler or fishing boat is allowed to land is the most effective, but also the most unpopular measure. Countries in Europe like Spain rely heavily on fishing and are naturally against any step which restricts their catch. But if the depletion of fishing stocks continues, there will be no fish left to fish. Take the disappearance of cod from the great banks off Newfoundland, which was once the richest cod fishing area in the Atlantic. After a dramatic fall in the cod population for some unknown reason, a ban was imposed, which, it was hoped, would lead to a repopulation of the cod stocks. The cod did not return, and many fishermen were put out of work. This is a scenario which we do not want to be repeated on a large scale.